Bueno, bienvenidas, bienvenidos a los seminarios del IRNAD. Eh, muchas gracias por acompañarnos y hoy la tenemos a Mary Jameson. Ella es eh, profesora de biología en la Universidad de Oakland eh, University, eso es en Estados Unidos, es cerca de Detroit. Eh, y como ven ahí en su primera diapositiva, eh, Mary y su grupo de trabajo eh, focalizan mucho en aspectos de interacciones ¿no? entre plantas y polinizadores eh, y también entre plantas eh, y herbívoros. Y en ese sentido también han eh, trabajado con cuestiones de, de, de ecología química y de paisaje. Y bueno, eh, tenemos la suerte de que vino a trabajar eh, con, con Carolina Quintero y ella fue lo suficientemente generosa como para <ríe> eh, proponer que, que Mary pudiera dar también un seminario aquí eh, en el instituto. Así que bueno, muchísimas gracias Mary, muchísimas gracias Caro, que creo que está ahí escondida detrás de, de, de la imagen de, de la granja de, de Mary. Y bueno, al final de la charla, ustedes pueden poner sus preguntas en el chat, si las ponen en inglés mejor, eh, directamente Mary las puede leer, y si las ponen en castellano, yo eh, las traduzco y Mary las, las contesta. Así que, bueno, comencemos. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Mary. So you can begin. Thank you. Yeah, muchas, muchas gracias por invitar, invitarme. Mi español no es muy bien, entonces voy a um, hablar y presentar en inglés, con permiso. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, it's my pleasure to be here visiting my good friend Carolina Quintero. And thank you so much, Lucas, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to present on my research. Um, so today I want to talk about a few different projects that we've been conducting in my lab over the last five years, looking at drivers of plant insect interactions uh, from the landscape level to uh, the level of molecules, essentially looking at um, interactions uh, with a focus on strawberries. And so in my research in uh, the US, we're really interested in all questions related to insect biodiversity and in particular plant insect interactions. So our mission is really to support plant and insect conservation. And this work is largely a collaboration with a great group of students, both undergraduates and graduate students at Oakland University, which is, as Lucas mentioned, just north of Detroit, about 20 minutes. And so today I'll be presenting on research by a handful of um, graduate students who have worked in my lab, um, mostly the, the four here who have recently graduated. Um, And I've also had I have a new graduate student that we've started to work on, and I'll kind of introduce just very briefly some of that work um, at the beginning here. So I mentioned our mission is really to support biodiversity. And so we collaborate in research, education, and community engagement projects that aim to support biodiversity, conservation, natural resource management, and sustainable agriculture. So what I'll talk about mostly today is our work looking at sustainable agriculture. So we work both in these agricultural systems here shown on the left, where we have native plants that we have Um, we're, that we're about ready to give out to farmers throughout our area to help support pollinators. But we also work in natural areas. and These are largely grassland habitats um, throughout our area. And um, so a lot of this work is done on a student farm at the uh, Oakland University campus. Um, but we also work with a number of community partners because of course, biodiversity needs everyone. And so, In our research, education, and conservation efforts, we really rely heavily on collaborations and on community engagement. And so this community engagement involves a number of partners throughout our area, um, which is really considered the Detroit metropolitan area in Michigan. And so usually when I start out my talk, I like to 
just introduce the importance of insects. And I think this is a group that has done a lot of great work on um, insect biodiversity. So I don't think I need to spend too much time on this, but just to, as a reminder, um, insects provide important ecosystem services uh, as a food source for many organisms such as birds. In pest control, here we see a, a tomato hornworm caterpillar with the parasitoid wasps. And insects are also important in nutrient cycling. Um, in particular, caterpillars and herbivores um, are very important in nutrient cycling. And so here we see an example of a fertilizer that's actually produced from insect frass or insect um, poop, that is. And of course, as your group is very familiar with Lucas, um, pollination services are extremely important um, in uh, providing us with some of our most nutritious fruits and vegetables. And um, it's really these pollinators that are important. And a pollinator you're probably familiar with that, that introduced Bombus terrestris here, and, and uh, which is of course native to Europe, but um, common throughout the area. We've seen this at, at a number of the farms um, that I've visited with Carolina here. Um, so another thing I, I don't think I have to spend too much time on is um, this alarming trend that we're seeing throughout the, the world in terms of insect declines. We're seeing uh, significant population declines for a number of species and decreases in overall insect biomass. Some of that work has been very well documented in Europe and um, elsewhere. Um, and we're starting to see this um, throughout the, the world really. And so, um, you know, I know that there, we have seen doc documented declines in Bombus in the US and you guys as well, um, have seen similar declines due to a number of factors, including um, harmful agricultural practices um, like the introduction, introduction of non-native species. And so one thing I'm very passionate about, and I'd like to just start off and take a little detour, um, is really communicating science and uh, the need for promoting conservation, not only within the academic community, but beyond the academic community. And so one thing we've done is we've worked with a number of I would say artists, including filmmakers, photographers, and illustrators, and they've helped us really communicate this message about the importance of insects and plant and pollinator conservation uh, to a broader audience. And so if you haven't had a chance to check out my website, I would um, like to invite you. I, I don't want to show this video today, but um, so I made a video with a uh, two of my neighbors actually, um, the Decca brothers, and they helped me showcase the importance of pollinators and the concern about insect decline in our area. So I'll just invite you to um, watch this video to learn a little bit more about our work, but for the sake of time, I'm not gonna show that today. But this beautiful image here was taken by a photographer that we work with, uh, Joseph Ferrero. He's done an amazing job. I just love to include him in my research efforts and educational efforts because he really has the ability to capture the diversity of pollinators that we see in our area. And especially um, just even the functional importance of these pollinators. So here we are out in the field, um, we, these, taking some pictures of the bees that we're seeing, visiting some of the flowers in our, our natural habitats. And what I love about this is that he is such a great photographer that you can actually start to see traits that are not only important for identifying bees, but you actually start to see some of the functional importance of the pollinators and carrying pollen. You can even see the diversity of pollen on the body of these bees. And so this has really been a valuable tool that we're starting to try to figure out how we can incorporate that into our research more so. And so here's an, an example. Um, 
photography in general. Um, and we are very interested in using um, citizen science in our work. Um, but one thing that the value of having someone who is skilled in macro photography is we can start to document these very small bodied bees like the Lazioglossum species um, that are very diverse in our region. And so this has really been a valuable tool. So not only do we document them in, our, in their natural habitats, but we're also trying to document them so that we have a variety of traits shown so we can start to use these images uh, for non-lethal identification purposes um, so that taxonomists can help us identify these insects. And so we've, uh, we've relied increasingly more on non-lethal collection methods and trying to use photography to document the biodiversity in our area. And we use students to do this in addition to photographers like Joseph Herrero. And many of these photos we post to iNaturalists as a tool to help us both in documenting the biodiversity in our area, but also as a tool that has started to help us with identification. There are a number of taxonomists who have really been valuable in helping us identify. So throughout our area, we are documenting a, a vast diversity of insects. And this is actually something that we're doing as a service to some of our local parks and municipalities. And so we also use iNitrous as a tool not only to document the distribution of species throughout the area, both plants and insects, but we also use it as a, as a teaching tool for the public where we can create guides within iNaturalists to help individuals identify species on their own when they're out in the field with their, or visiting a park with their, um, with their phones. So I'm getting a message that my, my internet might be unstable. So I think what I should do is go ahead and turn off my video and see if that might give me a little bit more bandwidth here. Um, and please, if you have any trouble hearing me or um, seeing my video, just go ahead and send a message in the chat and I'll, I will see that. So we've also, beyond iNaturalist, we use these images to help with educating the public about the diversity of pollinators and some of the ecology. So we've been very active on Instagram, posting photos um, to an account, Plants for Pollinators. And so in this uh, social media platform, we're really interested in promoting native plants and so I'm um, trying to encourage more citizens in our area to start planting native species that are especially valuable in supporting our pollinators. And so you can go there and check out some of the pictures from our, our organic farm and some of the activities that we've been involved in in the area at other farms. Okay, so now to jump into the research side of my talk. Um, so I want to introduce a few projects that really kind of bridge both landscape ecology and chemical ecology uh, with a heavier emphasis on the research we've done kind of within the field of landscape ecology and then just kind of ending with some of the work we've done in chemical ecology. And so as I mentioned, uh, much of this work is really centered around um, strawberry production. It's a focal study species that we've looked at um, to start understanding more about plant pollinator interactions, but also plant herbivore interactions and plant insect microbe interactions. And so I'll try to touch on um, a few different studies where we've looked at some of these questions in our area. So when you, at least when we think of agriculture in the US, this is really what we think of in terms of strawberry production. These are large monoculture crop systems found primarily in California and in Florida. This is what a typical strawberry field looks like out there. Um, there's a, a variety of different production systems that are popping up. Here is a plasticulture system. Um, but of course, when I moved to Michigan, 
Um, so here I am, just to give you a little uh, context in geography. So um, much of my work is happening here in Michigan, kind of the northern climates of Michigan. So much of the uh, strawberry production, though, is happening out in California. So this is where a lot of the big ag is happening, and also in Florida. In Michigan, though, we have much smaller farms. And in my area, in the Detroit area, metropolitan area, we have a number of urban farms that are popping up. This is actually a growing trend, not only in Michigan and in the US, but really across the globe. There's an interest in urban farm production and producing crops locally for sustainability and for improved quality of fruits and vegetables. And so when I moved to Michigan about six years ago, I was really inspired by work by a number of individuals, including Mary Gardner at Ohio State University and Stacy Philpott at University of California, Santa Cruz. They're looking at urban farms and gardens in other parts of the U.S. And I wanted to start looking at it within our state, Michigan, in the metropolitan Detroit area. So here's an example of an urban farm in the metropolitan Detroit area. So as you can see, the cropping systems are very diverse. This looks very different from the big agriculture that we see, the monoculture crops in, in California. And so I really was inspired by this paper that looked at the future of urban agriculture and biodiversity ecosystem services that address some of the challenges and future directions for research in urban agriculture. And one of the things that this paper pointed out was that we really don't know about factors controlling crop production in urban environments, but there might be a number of reasons why we might expect urban environments to be different from production systems in rural environments. Not only do we have differences like um, the way crops are grown, but also in the, the scale of the farms um, and a number of other factors, of course, this influence of urbanization and impervious surfaces that um, exist with roads and buildings and um, shopping centers. And so we started asking the question, how does urbanization influence um, pollinators and pollination services? And really focusing on bees, because of course, bees are really the, the primary pollinators of agricultural crops. And so urbanization can influence crop production and plant and tick interactions in a number of ways by altering habitat. So we think of habitat loss as well as fragmentation by perhaps we initially thought maybe a decrease in floral resources or altered nesting substrates. And we also have things um, to consider like urban warming and pollution. And so this research was led by two graduate students in my lab, Anna Terrell and Caleb Wilson, who have since gone on to work in um, other areas uh, at the USDA and North Carolina State University. Um, so I'll introduce some of their research, which would kind of looked at this broad question of how does urbanization influence pollinators and crop production. And so in their research, um, so I've, what I've done is I've combined a, a couple of studies in our lab looking at uh, plant, conducting plant and pollinator surveys across the rural urban gradient. So we're located in Oakland County. Um, and then just to give you some context here, mo much of this area here is the Detroit metropolitan area. So Detroit sits here in Wayne County. And then basically we have an urban sprawl that moves out to three different counties in our area. And so we surveyed 25 sites over the last five years. And I'm showing data here for just four years. And a, a large majority of these sites were farms and community gardens that produced mixed vegetable and uh, fruit crops. 
and flowers as well. And in many cases, uh, we also though have a number of parks and natural areas that we've surveyed plants and pollinators as well. And so just to give you an idea of this rural to ur urban gradient it involves a diversity of different farmers. Um, here's an example of cold frame farm. This is one of our farms um, in Macomb County. And here you can see the landscape context. Um, this is really just at the center the core of the farm. You can see some of the production systems, some of the hoop houses um, or greenhouses that they have at the farm. And then you can see kind of in the landscape context, um, we have a lot of um, old field habitat. Then we have our peri-urban farm as one example of and the suburban farms, this is the Oakland University student organic farm. And here's what that looks like. We have the urban farm. Um, and you can kind of see now we're starting to see more roads, cities, and buildings. Um, but an interesting thing about the Detroit area is that we have essentially what's ha happened is a deindustrialization. Um, where there have been um, different properties, um, abandoned lots essentially, um, where there has been a depopulation happening in the city due to the loss of industrial activity. And so some of these va vacant lots have been turned into farms. So here at the center, this is another urban farm that we have. And so we used, uh, land, we used uh, GIS to look at land use and land cover in our farms and parks. Here's an example um, of a rural area where you can see, and um, this is actually one of our natural habitats. And then here is um, one of our urban farms where we have a pollinator planting um, in one of the urban farms. So we conducted site level plant and pollinator surveys using traditional collection methods, including beebles, netting, and photography. And just to give you an overview of what the pollinator community looks like, we found 165 bee species. And we had a tremendous amount of help from a number of taxonomists, Jason Gibbs, Rob Jean, Karen, um, oh. I forget her last name. <laughs> Anyhow, I will just say I'm not a taxonomist, but we had um, a number of people helping us on this front to help identify the diversity of insects. Um, usually, um, we're able to get down at least to genus, um, but in many cases, especially for the lazy glossum, we really need the help of experts like Joe Wilson. So this is just a rank abundance graph showing you the variety of different species. Um, and so here we have the total abundance of individual bees of different genera. And as you can see, many of these genera are rare and represented by only a single species or a single individual that we found. Um, and some of these, genera are really diverse, like the lazy blossom and like Hylaeus or Andrina. These are very diverse um, groups or genera. So we found 33 genera in total, and these are the top four species that we found, Apis mellifera, the honeybee, and Bombus and Patients, um, which is our common eastern bumblebee, Ago chlorella, which is a green sweat bee, and helictus, which is another sweat bee. So here you can just kind of see a bit of the diversity. So to address this question of how, how does urbanization affect bees in Southeast Michigan? Um, well, first we started looking at across our different farms. Um, what did the bee community look like? So this, this is a graph showing the total abundance of wild bees and the total abundance of honeybees. And here you can see that above it is the total number of species that we see at each of the sites. 
So those would be the species that are in orange. In yellow, that's the total abundance of honeybees. So you can see across the rural urban gradient, we see quite a few um, honeybees across our farms, both in the urban areas here and in the rural areas. We also see a wide diversity of wild bees with 42 species to about 15 species, some variation, but not a real pattern um, across that gradient. And so of course, as others have shown, um, including um, in this study that we showed in 2019, it's really the functional traits that mediate bee response to urbanization. And so in our research, we've looked at a variety of functional traits from geographic origin, nesting strategy, body size, diet breadth, sociality. And we found that these functional traits are very important in explaining bee response to urbanization. So we found that exotic bee species abundance is positively associated with urbanization. Um, cavity nesting bees, actually this is um, species richness, um, cavity nesting bees and solitary bees are all positively associated. And of course these traits are not mutually exclusive. Many of our exotic bees are also cavity nesting bees and solitary bees. We found in general that urbanization positively influences bee diversity and evenness. So as we increase with urbanization, we see an increase in species diversity and species evenness. And overall across all studies, we see really this positive association between the number of bee species and urbanization. Although as you can see, there's quite a bit of variability across our sites. Um, so we have some rural sites that have kind of a lower diversity, um, some that have a much higher diversity and um, kind of across, but the general trend is an increase in number of species as we increase with urbanization. And so across to all of our studies, we found that urban areas tend to have a higher number and proportion of introduced non-native bee species. And so we followed up um, in adding to our 15 sites that we did research and we combined our data with researchers at the University of Michigan, some graduate students there who had a, a data set with another 15 sites. And so then we had a, a total of 30 sites that we could evaluate over a broader a five county area and really asked this question, does urbanization really favor exotic bee species? Or, if so, you know, what are the implications for conservation in cities? And so as you can see from this map, we do tend to see that these um, urban areas have a higher proportion of exotic bees compared to our rural areas. So exotic bees are shown here in purple. Honeybees also, they're very common both in the urban and rural environments. And in this study, um, when we combined our 30 sites, we found that urban areas are in fact hot spots for exotic bees. Um, at, and that's, that trend is really driven um, by a number of species that have been introduced. We have about 21 species of introduced bees and as not really um, necessarily driven by honeybees, which we see across the landscape are rather abundant both in the urban and um, rural areas. So here you can see no relationship with urbanization. And um, this trend is really driven by these other exotic non apis species. So one interesting finding is that um, we saw all that urbanization had a negative effect on new social bees. And so in our system, these new social bees are bombus species. 
We have about six species that we've documented in our area. So there's a negative relationship between urbanization and bombus abundance. We also see a negative relationship with lazioglossum species, uh, which are primitively eusocial. Um, one thing we did find though, which may be seen as a, a positive um, effect is that floral resources were positively associated with the university and use social bee abundance, suggesting that perhaps if we plant a variety of species um, that we might be able to improve the conditions for some of these eusocial bees. Um, so both the total bloom cover of floral resources and the diversity of floral resources were significant predictors of eusocial bee abundance. And so this trend gets even stronger if we look across our, our studies um, throughout the four years and a couple of student projects where we see that plant species richness is positively associated with bee species richness. And so we've tried to look at this question a little more um, deeply with um, doing some network analyses and some follow-up experiments looking at uh, the plant community and which flowers are attracting which bees. And this researchers this research was led by Anna Terrell, who completed her master's degree in my lab. And we've had some assistance um, with the network analyses from Brian Spiesman at Kansas State University. So here you can see the different genera that we see in our area. You can see um, Bombus is very dominant in our system. Um, and here you can see the diversity of flowers on the bottom. Um, we have about 60 to 70 flower species. And in this uh, plant pollinator network, we have the introduced exotic species um, shown here in purple, and the native species are shown in blue. So as you can see, many of the, um, at least at the generic level, we see that these plants are utilizing um, many species showing patterns of generalist, there's a high degree of generalism um, in these pollinator communities. And so we're still working on this paper and analyses, um, but just to show you some of the floral resources in our area, um, we have a number of native and introduced species. One of our most dominant Plants is an introduced exotic plant, but we also have a number of native species that are found throughout our farms. And we see a growing interest in um, the cultivation and planting of native species within the farms. Um, so interestingly, we found that the highest proportion of native plant species was observed in our peri-urban habitats or our suburban habitats in a lower proportion of native species or greater abundance of exotic species in our most rural and our most urban sites. And so this seems to be driven by um, individuals in our rural area or in our peri-urban areas who are really interested in planting native species in their gardens. Okay, so to shift gears now, the question about how, what kind of factors are influencing crop production. So we use strawberry as a, as a model system because we were really interested in understanding factors influencing crop production, not only environmental factors, but also genetic factors. So strawberry is a great model system because it, can be planted in a wide variety of habitats. And also because it's a clonal species, which allows us to get at these questions of how genotype may influence uh, response to uh, environment. And so this research was led by a PhD student, Kyla Scher in my lab, just recently graduated. And she looked at what the key drivers of strawberry production are across it, the rural urban gradient with a focus on pollinators, 
pests, and pathogens. So in this study, we decided to use the raised bed planting system, which is common in our urban farms. Uh, this is uh, something a lot of farmers do perhaps to avoid uh, soil contamination um, or for aesthetic reasons um, to avoid pests like small mammals that we have commonly in our area, like groundhogs um, or mice or other small rodents. Um, so here we have these uh, four by eight feet raised boxes. And across the farms that we studied, uh, so we had 10 study sites in this system, um, we plant, we use the same soil in all sites, um, at least um, a, a mix of soil that we brought into the sites and um, put in these raised beds. And so we conducted pollinator surveys across 10 farms for this study using the same methods as previously described. And then we looked at crop production. So we have one paper that we published just recently um, from this work. This is Kyla's first chapter of her dissertation. Um, and this is the uh, looking at across three years, what are the key abiotic and biotic drivers of strawberry productivity? So here you can see the 10 sites that she studied in the area. We have some highly urban sites and some rural sites. You can see the kind of the diversity of land cover here. And we had a system where we were planting day neutral strawberries, including al two cultivars, Albion and Seascape, across these 10 sites in the raised bed systems. And so the take home message from this study is that pests and pathogens were key biotic factors and that pollinators were important, but less so. Um, so this graph shows as you, we have the, of course, a proportion of damage is increased. So greater pathogen and pest damage, we have a reduction in the total crop yield. So here on this axis, we have the total weight of all fruits produced over the growing season. And you can see that's a function of the proportion damage, of course. Um, and we do see some benefit of pollination here. So we see that with high amounts of pollination, so greater pollinator visitation, we do see a benefit, um, but this is really only at levels of damage that are 50% or less. So these are all organic systems. So there are no chemical inputs. Um, so in our, in our systems, of course, we have um, a high amount of fruit damage. So if we take the, the pests and pathogens out of the equation, though, this is what it looks like in terms of we've got the number of bees per flower and the total fruit rate weight produced um, across our different plants. You can see pollinators do enhance production. And just to give you a little bit of a view of the pollinator diversity across our farms, we found 64 species of wild bees. One of our most abundant species is Agochlorella. We have Ceratina, small sweat bee, sorry, small carpenter bee. And then um, this is just showing the top 25 species in kind of a rank abundance order. And in some cases here, we have species that we're not able to resolve. So these are actually complex uh, species. Okay, so now I just wanna kind of conclude my talk with the, the last couple of studies where we're shifting and now to looking at the chemical ecology and the chemical mediation of species interaction. And so the final uh, presentation, the final portion of my presentation will focus on research led by Rob Wiley, um, where we were looking at um, strawberry production and the influence of mycorrhizae, beneficial organisms, and um, antagonist herbivores. And so Rob has uh, recently graduated and moved on to North Texas University. And this work was in collaboration with Amy Trowbridge, 
Um, she helped us work on some of the strawberry volatile production. Um, and so one question we were really interested in is how, how do these chemicals in particular, in this case, uh, floral volatiles mediate species interactions and does interaction, do the interactions between mycorrhizae and herbivores influence functional traits? So we're really interested in both how, how these antagonists and mutualists interact to affect the functional traits. So there can be a variety of ways that chemistry might mediate these species interactions. Um, we've summarized some of these um, potential direct and indirect effects here in a paper in Current Opinion and in Insect Science, so I won't spend too much time on that. Um, but instead, kind of jump to our central research question, which is how does genotype mycorrhizal inoculation and herbivory influence um, plant physiology, biomass allocation, and floral volatile emissions? And I'm just going to show you a few results uh, from this study. First off, as expected, we saw that herbivory reduced total flower and fruit production. So in this case, we had a simulated herbivory that was 25%. It was quite a bit higher than we would normally see in um, production systems. Usually we don't see herbivory much higher than um, 20%. Um, and we found that mycorrhizal inoculation enhanced um, both fruit and flower number, uh, but the effects on total fruit weight depended on genotype. So just to walk you through this graph here, we have no herbivory and herbivory, and then we have uh, with mycorrhizae and uh, without mycorrhizae. So you can see this enhancement of production with mycorrhizae here for flowers, for fruit, and then this interaction for fruit weight. So. Um, just to drill down, we found that genotypes, we have three different cultivars of strawberries, which represent three different genotypes, effectively, we have Seascape, Tribute, and Wasatch. And you can see that it was really just for one cultivar that we had uh, a strong enhancement of fruit production. Um, in particular under conditions of no herbivory. In this case, we had a 42% higher overall total yield. And so I wanna try to wrap up so I can save at least a little bit of time. So I'll kind of walk you through, I know some complicated results pretty quickly here, um, but, but one of the key findings was that genotype and herbivory were really key factors explaining variation in floral volatile emissions. Um, in particular, we saw that several terpenoid compounds increased with herbivory. Um, so here we see in the purple are different terpenoid compounds. And then we also have benzenoids and alphatics. And what we graph here is the, the overall effect of genotype. So you can see our three genotypes and um, we see variation across the genotypes. Um, we also see that herbivory, so shown kind of the light gray and dark gray, um, that we see an enhancement of terpenes. Uh, we see a decrease in some cases with benzenoids and um, slight increase with alphatics uh, with herbivory. So, I know there's a lot to unpack in that, that figure, um, but just for the sake of time, I wanna just wrap up um, showing um, kind of what we're working on and really interested in um, kind of most recently, which is now starting to think about how these volatiles and other aspects of plant chemistry can influence. Well, of course, we're interested in pollinators. Um, but we're also interested in the plant microbiome. And so we've been looking at the microbes that are on the flowers in particular and thinking about looking at them on the fruit. And we think that these are important potentially for disease resistant, but for a number of other things. We know that the microbes in the flowers, for example, are important for pollinator attraction. 
And so this is one direction that we're going in our research. And we had a paper that we just got accepted and horticulture research showing that genotypic variation in floral volatiles is more strongly influenced um, the floral, more strongly influences the floral microbiome than biotic effects of herbivores and mycorrhizae. So here you can just see um, the main effects of genotype on bacterial diversity and fungal diversity and variation in the composition of volatiles for our three different genotypes. Um, so it's really um, genotype that is the, the main predictor of variation in floral volatiles. And so how does genotype influence the volatiles? Well, we really think it's being driven by differences in flower abundance, flower diameter, um, and the, their effects on both the volatiles as well as the bacterial and fungal microbiome. In particular, we have some important floral yeast um, that are being influenced. And um, I'll invite you to read the paper to get further details with that. Um, but I would just like to conclude my study by saying, or my presentation by saying that we're hoping to really start looking at how the landscape and the chemistry could mediate the interactions uh, both with the pollinators and the herbivores and the plants kind of in a multi-species context. And these are complex systems and we really want to know more about the complexity of these ecological interactions. And with that, I would just like to say, um, I am really happy to be here in Argentina working with Carolina Quintero and I have enjoyed my time in this country and I'll just say, please connect with me if you have any interest in this and let's work together. With that, I will end and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Marie. Aquellos que quieran poner sus preguntas las pueden escribir en el chat. Lo pueden hacer en inglés o en castellano y ahí lo, lo, lo traducimos. Hopefully that wasn't too fast. I know there is a lot of <laughs> different projects. I just didn't yeah. know which one to choose. I wanted to talk about it all. Okay, is, so yeah. I see one question. Um, the question is, what priorities would you suggest when designing cultivated biodiversity to support pollinators, support rare pollinators, support poor local communities, supporting guilds of crop pollinators or anything else? Um, well, um, that's a great question, thank you. And so one thing we are lucky in our, the Eastern US, we have a great group of bee researchers like Sam Droji at the USGS, and they've done a great job of putting together lists of specialist uh, bee species. And so one thing that he recommends is that we should be, if we focus on the specialists and including the native plants that those specialists feed on, then we'll not only protect those specialists, more rare species, but we'll also be protecting the diversity of generalists. And so I think that's a really great point. And in addition to that, um, we, one thing I will keep in mind and just say um, that there are exotic species in our case, at least, um, they're not always bad, especially in the farm systems. We do have some cosmopolitan weeds that can be very important for supporting insect biodiversity that are both used as larval host plants, like we have Plantago lanceolata. I know you guys have that here. That's actually an important species for a number of butterflies. Um, 
less so for bees, but we have other species like the clover that's important for a number of bees. So um, we both wanna promote the native species and encourage more plant planting of more native species. Um, but we also have to think about maybe just not caring as much about weeds or controlling weeds, especially with herbicides in these farms. So thank you for that question. Um, hopefully I answered it. Uh, <laughs> we, we tend to plant a diversity of flowers. Um, we make sure that we have um, early season, mid season and late flowers. So we have a, a bloom that's really happening from early May to late October in our area. That's about the, the extent of the growing season. Okay, we have another question. Um, it, thank you. Um, so this is about any particular ontology to capture the concepts and relationships. And um, I'm not sure I fully understand that question. I think in our case, um, what we did is we looked through several publications in the taxonomic literature to identify um, what we thought were you know, five important functional traits and then I really tried to kind of focus on those. So we are fortunate to have really great taxonomic keys in the US and we're really able to use that. Of course, um, to some extent, those are um, broad estimates of, of functional traits. Um, so um, in our case though, we were really using kind of a simpler approach to looking at uh, functional traits, which is just kind of breaking it into categories and then looking at how those categories might help predict response of bees. So I'm not sure if that fully answered your question, but I'm happy to chat about that uh, more if you're interested. Um, Okay, we have another question. Uh, differ may differences in habitat requirement between solitary and eusocial bees be responsible for the different response to urbanization? Thank you, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think there is certainly some evidence in the literature that we know that for the eusocial bees, um, there was a great paper out of Rufus Isaac's group that showed that, at least for Bombus, that um, floral diversity is important predictor of eusocial bees. So that could potentially be one factor. But we also know um, bumblebees can be particularly sensitive, potentially to urban warming. There's some evidence of that. Um, from other studies, um, Steve Frank's group. And so that may be one factor potentially explaining um, the use social bees. Um, in terms of a greater number of cavity nesting bees, we know that a lot of the introduced exotic bees are cavity nesting bees. It's one of the ways um, that they actually move from their native origin to their introduced origin is in through um, plant material potentially or um, woody material and species. Um, so that's maybe one form of where the introduction potentially. So that could also maybe driving um, the positive relationship with, uh, with some of the cavity nesting solitary bees. And then, yes, for the use social bees, a number of the species we have are also ground nesters. So one of the negative environmental factors could just be the increase in purpose. So I think we have just a couple of minutes. I don't know if there's a, a final question. <laughs> yeah, I think they, oh, there's another one there. 
Have you seen some relationships between the type of compost or fertilizer in the insects that visit the plants? Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, that's great. Um, it's actually something that we haven't really looked at, um, but I certainly think that would be a great um, area to pursue. One thing that we have been interested in is looking at the different types of, we call them mulch systems, or it's like compost, but essentially it's ground cover. And so in strawberries in particular, we're moving, we're moving a lot to plastic culture, so using plastic and planting the strawberries within the plastic. And so that's something that we're interested in because of course that could change the micro environment of the plants, potentially influencing both floral volatiles, attraction, but also the microbes. And so we know that floral yeasts are really important for bees and then for tracting bees. It's an important nutritional component for bees. And that may differ with the type of compost or ground cover. But in terms of um, you know, the fertilization effect of compost, no, we haven't looked at that. I think that's an interesting question. It's something we're concerned about in our area because we wanna to try to reduce fertilizer inputs, of course, due to pollution in the Great Lakes. Okay, thank you, Mari. That was a great talk. Yeah, um, thank you was... so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It was nice to meet you and hopefully I will see you around. Yeah. Entonces Mari se va a quedar hasta el 18 de diciembre por Bariloche. Aquellos que quieran contactarla, ahí pueden ir a la página web que tienen eh, en pantalla y mandarle un email. Y bueno, como ven, es una persona muy amable y abierta, así que Eh, bueno, muchas gracias por estar acá. Um, thank you, Mary, again. Eh, muchas gracias. <laughs> see you around. Thank you. Yeah, hasta luego.